I'll just say there's a once in a lifetime opportunity right now. And so if you've never paid attention to politics or policy and the things I'm saying matter to you, now is the time to engage and pay attention at what's happening at the federal level. Hello, and welcome to Solar for All, a podcast focused on the intersection of the clean energy sector and the issues of race, equity, social justice, and class. I'm your host, Jeff Greenfield. And uh, we're happy to have Amanda Woodrum uh, on our, as our guest today. Um, she is a senior researcher for Policy Matters Ohio. She's been doing this work for 14 years. Um, and Policy Matters is a nonprofit. We'll probably get into a little bit of the, the efforts that they're making in this space um, in the conversation. Uh, right now, she's also the director of a, a multi-organization project called Reimagine Appalachia. Uh, she has a JD and MA in law and economics from the University of Akron and did her undergrad at Bowling Green. And she is uh, joining us from Akron, Ohio, where she resides. And um, we'll be uh, having a great conversation. Things that are talked about uh, will be linked in the show notes at solarforall.show. That's solarforall.show. And uh, without further ado, welcome, Amanda. It's great to have you as a guest. Yeah, well, well let's, let's just jump right in. Um, first of all, Appalachia. Um, there's going to be, you know, podcast viewers in California and New York that might have heard of Appalachia, but aren't necessarily as familiar with it as you and I. Um, uh, is that how you say it? I say it Appalachia. I think it's spelled Appalachia. Um, you know, I guess name. It, it depends on what part of Appalachia you're in or you come from. Uh, there are different spellings, but if you're in West Virginia, do not say Appalachia. It's Appalachia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's part of it is respecting you know the the people. They get to they get to say what they want to be called, um, and uh, well, yeah, yeah. Well. Uh, Tell us a little bit about Reimagine Appalachia and how you got involved in this work. Sure. So as you mentioned, I, I've been working at what I describe as the intersection of energy, equity, um, and the environment for over 15 years, really um, around finding the common ground uh, between diverse sets of stakeholders, so environmental advocates, organized labor, so union leaders, racial justice advocates. And um, in that space, there's just a, a very unique set of ideas and principles that that come out of that work around where that common ground is. And the last few years have been very divisive. So this work is, is more important than ever because we really have to find our common ground and common humanity. So I got pulled into work um, along with a you know, number of advocates from these diverse groups across a four state region that includes Ohio, West Virginia, uh, Kentucky, and Pennsylvania, um, the, which is referred to as the Ohio River Valley region of Appalachia, um, also known as Colt Country. And we came together with the idea that uh, national climate change legislation is going to happen. It was the center of debates um, during the national presidential election, but the conversations are being driven by folks on the East and West Coast. And we felt that, you know, Appalachia needs to be at the table of those conversations, or frankly, it's gonna be on the menu. And so we have been working with environmental leaders, labor leaders, um, racial justice advocates and and others to create a vision for a 21st century Appalachia um, and figure out the blueprint 
essentially for how do we get from where we are to where we need to go. And the bottom line is that if in fact Appalachia is at the table, we can turn it into an opportunity um, to bring in much needed federal resources into the region. Wow. Well, that's a pretty good overview and, uh, and a tough challenge ahead. Um, I, I, I'm thinking of several follow-up questions, um, but maybe one I'll start with. Labor is a tough organization to work with in the environmental sector. They, the, the labor leaders that I know and that I've talked to have to balance commitments to their stakeholders that might work at conventional old school fossil fuel plants and are also looking at this emerging technology of clean energy um, and trying to satisfy, in some cases, competing, uh, competing stakeholders. What's the latest thinking from, I mean, you're a lot closer to these folks than I am. How are they viewing this right now? And what are some of the uh, pieces of that conversation that you're hearing? Sure. I mean, there's, there is common ground. You just really have to dig a little to find it. It's out there. And we imagine Appalachia focuses on what we want versus what not, you know, not what we don't want, right? We're not trying to shut down the coal plants. That's not part of our thing. What we are calling for is infrastructure investments. And I think at the end of the day, as long as you can make sure the jobs that you're creating are good jobs and union jobs, then unions will be overall agnostic. I mean, at the end of the day, what union workers want is good jobs so they can put food on their table. And it's important to understand that the coal industry, the fossil fuel industry generally, uh, has been a source of good jobs. You know, we're talking about good pay and benefits. But they weren't always that way, right? Um, the union movement started in the coal mines. Coal miners made coal industry jobs, uh, good jobs by unionizing. <laughs> And we can do the same for the clean energy industry. And I think part of the problem in the past is that um, the jobs that have been created in, in clean energy have not been union. And um, so ultimately, if we can figure out um, how, how to promote union jobs within the clean energy industry, that, that we can change the political dynamics there. Sure, sure. I mean, wind jobs, uh, the EVs, everything. There's the clean energy umbrella is a lot of uh, things, not just technology, but also other mitigation efforts, right? Totally. And I think that's another piece of the puzzle is that you know, we're calling for significant federal investments ac across a wide range of things. Um, Moving towards a, a 21st century sustainable climate is not just about wind and solar. It's so much more than that. We need to modernize the grid. Um, that means beefing it up um, for more distributed generation. It also means putting more of the grid underground so it can better weather severe storms. It also means incorporating universal broadband. Um, because you can't have a 21st century economy without access to broadband. We know that. And that's true for every sector of our economy. Just that alone, you can imagine how many jobs could be created. Um, and those are typically good union jobs, much of that work. Um, then there's building out a more sustainable transportation system. Um, people think of public transit as an urban issue, but it's not. Um, it's not just an urban issue. It's also a problem in rural areas. And we've underinvested in our region in public transportation for nearly a century. Uh, and many of those jobs could be, um, and often are union jobs and expanding public transit uh, to a significant uh, extent would create a lot of work for folks driving buses, dispatchers, but also we need to be thinking about upgrading our rail system, which has been 
you know, um, it really hasn't been upgraded since before World War II. Just like our grit. I describe our grit as big brown poles with black wires everywhere. We can do better. Um, and we can put a lot of people work in the process. So you know, we put together a, a blueprint. And we fed it through an economic impact study. And we found that it, if we do these things, if we get the federal investments in these different areas, we can create over half a million jobs across our four states. Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, um, and Kentucky. And that's a lot of jobs for this region. Um, potentially, if we make sure that those jobs come with community and labor standards that uh, that they could be good union jobs too. So it all sounds pretty darn awesome and hasn't happened yet. And organizations like yours are working hard to, to push for it. Who's pushing against it or who's pushing, who's resisting it? Or maybe a better question is what forces stand in the way of this happening? Well, you know, politics are politics. Um, there's always political obstacles to any significant legislation. I would say that on the whole, nobody's really opposed to making infrastructure investments. Uh, that has been a need for a very long time and the COVID pandemic in particular um, revealed for instance, we have got to figure out this broadband situation. And so people uh, of all you know, political stripes are ready to make some investments. I think the question becomes how big and in what exactly. And uh, I think we've made a lot of progress, um, say in the, in the past decade or so on the recognition that uh, climate change is happening. I mean, in Appalachia, if we're not getting the wildfires, but we've got massive flooding and severe storms all across the country. We've got rolling blackouts and brownouts of our electric grid, like something needs to be done and people know it. Um, and, you know, for farming in Appalachia, the floods have been devastating. Um, and so, Slowly but surely, there's a recognition that something needs to be done. And um, so I I am very optimistic that we will, in fact, get something passed. Um, but I think it's an all-hands-on-deck moment to make sure it's big and it's robust and that Appalachia gets out of it what it deserves. And... We have a lot of political leaders in the region that recognize the value of what we're saying, that if in fact Appalachia is at the table of these national climate change conversations, um, that it can secure its really frankly deserved uh, federal investments because our region has fueled literally the prosperity for the rest of the nation for nearly a century while itself has dealt with severe poverty the region has been exploited by absentee corporations in the extractive industries our workers have been exploited our land has been left scarred and our workers and our neighbors left sick and and too many of appalachia's communities are actually in the bottom 10 percent of the country for high poverty rates, low incomes. Um, and we can and should recognize the contribution that Appalachia a coal country has made to the prosperity of the nation and respond in kind by now giving it its fair share of these uh, national climate infrastructure investments. And that's what we're calling for. Well, well, you put that really succinctly. And um, I agree, you know, Athens County, where Third Sun Solar is headquartered, is the poorest county in the state of Ohio. And we're doing really a lot better than many parts of West Virginia and Kentucky. 
Um, and then uh, Pennsylvania as well, you, you put those four states that uh, you're focused on in this project. Um, all four states are so semi-purple politically, and you could definitely dig in and see that there's a lot of blue cities and um, very red rural areas. Um, you know, I think uh, Senator Joe Manchin is in the national spotlight as a, a moderate Democrat swing vote, you know, uh, senator um, in this tiny majority or tiny, tiny uh, majority, if you count uh, the vice president in the Senate and wields a lot of power. He's got a challenging situation where he is representing West Virginia which used to be a very strong, solid, democratic-leaning state that has been part of this rural areas moving towards conservatism, rural areas embracing uh, people like President Trump. Uh, what have you observed that's led to that? And I, I don't want to get into you know, recreating a lot of the, the stories that are out there, but I, I'm interested in your per perspective and observations on this dynamic. Yeah, no, I think you hit the nail on the head that historically this region has been blue, um, not red. But here's the problem. Like we just talked about, the region has been in poverty um, for a very long time, frankly, since the original New Deal. Um, and that has, I mean, politicians of all stripes have come to the region and made promises and uh, with their with solutions that have never come to pass. Um, and that's been true, you know, uh, for decades across from presidents from both parties. Um, and still the region is in poverty. And frankly, you know, Appalachia should be, you know, by all means, the richest region in the world. I mean, at least in the country, um, because it is so rich with resources, but it's not, it's the poorest because it's been exploited and you can't ignore that without there being repercussions. And that's why it's so important right now that we get this national climate infrastructure package, right. And that means creating a specific thoughtful plan for Appalachia and by Appalachia. Let's let Appalachians tell you what the region needs. And we've done that. Reimagine Appalachia has, I mean, gone through painstaking processes, listening sessions across the four states of, uh, for all kinds of different stakeholders and put together the blueprint for what we need. And you can find it at reimagineappalachia.org. Yeah, we're going to have links to uh, several documents and even some video content that's very nicely produced talking through these that can be resources for, for folks that want to take a deeper dive. Um, all that will be in the show notes for this episode. Um, so the extractive industries of the past, the coal that fueled our, our electric and transportation industries for you know, 100 plus years, and then even the steel that built the skyscrapers in, in you know, uh, Pittsburgh and, and uh, Philadelphia and uh, New York City, um, all came from this region. The timber before that was cut and, and shipped out. Um, and what, what did we get left with? We have black lung. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, some rich traditions and some strong heritage and some cultural strengths. We've got beauty. Um, you know, I think West Virginia is, you know, celebrating uh, the creation of a, a, a national um, park uh, uh, over there um, this year, or maybe it happened at the end of last year. Uh, so recreation and tourism is one of the resources here, um, but that hasn't been enough. So, uh, tell me a little bit more about your vision for an economic renaissance uh, as we reimagine this region. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, we need to make sure we're investing to create a, 
a more sustainable economy. And when I say sustainable, I don't just mean green. I mean sustainable economically. And we have to have industries with jobs that are equivalent to those found in the fuel industry. So we have to be thoughtful about that. And we think that um, all the former steel facilities and the shuttered coal plants in the region, um, they have amazing infrastructure um, and with the right resources can be redeveloped uh, into manufacturing hubs, um, manufacturing centers that operate with environmentally friendly pra practices, their eco-industrial parks. Um, these, you know, these facilities have, you know, access to rail, access, you know, they're all built on along waterways um, where shipping can take place. Um, but they come with Oh, and they're all, you know, connected to the grid. Uh, but they do come with things like brownfield remediation needs, right? Coal ash ponds, for instance, coal slurries. So they need to be cleaned up first. Um, and that's sort of the first plank of our, our set of jobs is repairing the damage from the last century of extractive industry practices, like you already mentioned. And brownfield reme remediation is a really important piece of that work. At the end of the day, we are really digging into what do we think Appalachia could be a hub for? And there's some really obvious ideas. And I think one of them is battery technology. We already have some of the resources uh, available in the region. We're talking about technology that goes into electric vehicles, but also solar storage or wind storage or just renewable energy storage generally. And one of the things we recently learned is that these coal slurries and these coal ash ponds actually can be mined for rare earth minerals that go into um, battery technology, something that is in high demand right now. And so we think that this is another reason that Appalachia makes sense as a hub for battery technology. And the other interesting thing is it's a good job for miners. <laughs> they, they actually can mine these coal ash ponds. So that's really exciting. Another industry we think is good for Appalachia is bioplastic. And that's something we're super excited about. This region has led um, in plastics generally, and that's true globally. Um, and it could be a leader globally in the next generation of, of single use plastic alternatives like bioplastic. And we can grow the products that go into bioplastic right here in the region, uh, like hemp. And, and some of these projects are already sort of underway. So it's super exciting. But again, it requires federal investments to make it happen. Appalachia, like we've talked about, is poor. It's not going to lift itself up by the proverbial bootstraps. It can't. It doesn't have the resources. And that goes back to why we need federal investments. And those will be necessary to transform the region and ultimately change the politics. Um, as I think you sort of alluded to, Appalachia has long been a political stumbling block to national climate and clean energy solutions. And it will continue to be until we get this right. Yeah, you can't pull yourself up from your bootstraps if you're barefoot. Um, so the uh, you know just transition has been discussed quite a bit. And I've been specifically asked, you know, about uh, jobs in solar um, for folks that used to be in fossil fuels. And we actually have some employees, some folks on our team that um, are, you know, multi-generational mining families. And, you know, uh, an electrician that worked in the mines is, you know, able to work in, in uh, a solar installation, very transferable skill. But one of the, the big issues is pay. And especially after the mines, a lot of people don't know the details, but um, because of the unionization push 
as well as just general um, shifting from labor intensive to mechanized mining, tons and tons of jobs were eliminated per you know per ton of of ore mined, and the remaining jobs were more and more higher pay, higher quality jobs, safer working conditions. Still, you know, a lot of a lot of you know terrible you know tragic situations. Um, but in general, the trend has been towards higher pay. And so maybe uh, an operator of a long wall machine might be earning six figures um, and doing a, a, you know, bringing home a lot of money to support their family and invest in their own family's wealth accumulation um, and, you know, investing in education and all that stuff. Um, currently, uh, union uh, jobs are not the, the, the typical solar job. Solar is a still a young, scrappy, growing industry. Um, the majority of my friends and colleagues in solar are not in a union environment. They're, uh, you know, an open shop, as they say. Um, and, you know, I think people are making 40000 50000 60000 but not 100000 Are you expecting that with the changes that you're imagining that uh, a solar installer up on the roof might be pulling in close to $100,000? Well, I think like all things, there's a difference between residential and commercial work. There's also, you know, as we talked about earlier, we're talking about big federal investments and not just solar, um, but all kinds of things like modernizing the grid. Uh, but I, you know, when we're talking about federal investments, we're likely talking about, you know, industrial scale or commercial scale projects. Generally, unions um, in the building trades don't often do residential work um, for the most part. They do commercial grade. So we're talking about when we're building out solar farms or when we're putting solar panels on every single school in the state. Um, we're digging into this really cool um, idea right now related to public transit or school busing. So there's an interesting pilot project, um, I think in Georgia, but I'm, I could be wrong about that, but they are building a solar canopy for the bu the school buses um, would be parked under that. And then the solar canopy is connected to the school buses, um, actually mostly so that the batteries in the school buses can store the energy and put it back onto the grid when that energy is needed. That's the kind of project we're talking about. It's big. It, you know, you'd have to do hardening of the grid um, in order. So what I mean by that, sort of grid reinforcement or bulking up the grid, because you can imagine like plugging your car into your carport um, is is simple enough, right? Just get an extension cord, and you'll probably be fine. But plugging in an entire fleet of school buses is a whole other kind of thing that that requires work that's what i'm talking about modernizing the grid um so there's all kinds of work like that um like we d maybe not do one school at a time for solar and wind do you know all this make a contract to do you know bulk of school districts across the state and that's going to be a big project, long-term work, um, and uh, that should be done with a, a collective bargaining agreement. Right. Well, we, we've done plenty of work that does have a project labor agreement, and um, and if it's got federal funding, we've got Davis-Bacon wage laws on there, um, and uh, we use subcontractors that are, you know, some of them are union shops, and for the most part, um, at that level of, of industrial, large-scale projects, large commercial projects, um, there's a much smaller uh, delta between the union shop 
the cost to, to do it with union labor and the cost to do it without union labor. And I think that I'm in full agreement that um, there's a big danger of investing the billions of dollars in our en energy infrastructure um, without appropriate environmental and labor and community standards to make sure that that investment doesn't just go to line the pockets of the elite, many of them out of, out of our country, and certainly many of them out of state, um, that would benefit the most. Um, and these projects can benefit, obviously, uh, the investors that put up the money to do this and earn a return on their investment, but we can make sure that the workers that are actually digging the holes and carrying the load uh, aren't left uh, you know, holding a, an empty sack at the end of the day when, when things move, move on. Yeah, uh, that is very much. When there's public dollars involved, let's maximize the benefit of those taxpayer dollars to the community. And that means both community input and community access to the jobs created and labor standards to make sure that they're good jobs. Yeah, yeah. How would race enter into that discussion? Because that's one of the things that uh, during the campaign, the Biden campaign focused on quite a bit, this Build Back Better. And uh, it's a big focus of our podcast here is looking at how the environmental and climate benefits of the transition we're in uh, can be in, in lockstep parallel with the economic and social equity changes that I personally would like to see and many, many folks are excited about as well. Yeah, that's the beauty of um, these federal infrastructure investments. These public dollars can come with strings attached. Um, and we want to, we call for both community and labor standards to make sure the jobs we're creating are good union jobs, but also that we're building pathways into those union jobs for black workers, women, and people of color. One of uh, the most important things, um, I think, for racial justice is, you know, really dealing with the past history of lack of access for jobs and opportunities for black workers in particular. And um, they were left behind in the conventional energy economy. So we need to prioritize black workers in particular for opportunities in the new energy economy. And, and we can do that. There's best practices that teach us access exactly how that can be done and we've pulled that a lot of that together um for reimagine appalachia um and you know again this it goes back to when we're using public dollars so let's put strings attached and that an important piece of that is a set aside of work hours for on the job training opportunities um, for any project federally funded um, with uh, at least $100,000 in federal funds. And um, so on-the-job training opportunities and, and a first source hiring system uh, that bring folks into those on-the-job training opportunities. And that means priority for um, Black workers women and other people of color, but also co-workers, people um, disadvantaged by the uh, transition to the new energy economy. What does first source hiring mean? I'm not so familiar with that term. It's about developing like a one priority uh, for contractors on the job that they hire um, from a certain uh, set of folks and you, you define that in advance. And then you work with um, local community partners on a referral system, right? They help identify folks that meet um, the criteria that the community has defined for this 
community access and then also help make sure that they have the skills needed. Um, and it's something that's worked all over the country. So is proven method. Um, and it's something that's evolved out of what people have called the community benefit agreement movement, um, which is a, a national movement with lots of conversations here in this region as well. Yeah. Thanks for digging in. Um, uh, you know, um, the good news is we're not reinventing the wheel here or inventing a new wheel. We're, we're taking what's a proven model and, and amplifying it. Um, do these uh, kind of uh, programs also sometimes apply to folks with a record or folks that are leaving incarceration? Um, I'm interested in, in that uh, set of folks that what an uphill battle they've got with a, a felony on their record and um, probably some really high quality individuals that are facing headwinds as they try to do do well and and you know re-enter society. Definitely. Appalachia has been hit hard by the opioid epidemic and um, the so-called war on drugs. And we have just huge numbers of folks with criminal records that present just untenable barriers to employment. It is so hard to get access to employment with a criminal record and to make a life and a career for yourself. Um, and that, you know, is true in Appalachia, but it's really, it's true across the country. Um, so again, this is a, you know, federal public investments are a really good opportunity to tackle these kinds of barriers to employment. And we are particularly excited about work we're doing with Senator Casey in Pennsylvania, which is um, the idea is to revive the Civilian Conservation Corps and create work um, planting trees, restoring uh, wetlands, maybe putting the tops back on the mountains we blew off um, for uh, the coal industry purposes. And so you can imagine, I mean, you can put a lot of people to work doing that, and these would be essentially public jobs. Uh, and so it's a great opportunity to build a program around returning citizens and the barriers to employment they face. Um, like knock them down one at a time. Um, sort of like a pre, what's called a pre-apprenticeship model. Um, and it, it really mm -hmm. requires program thoughtfulness, um, a lot of work, to, you know, you can just imagine what f the barriers folks face when they return, like they don't have a home, um, they, you know, can't find a job, Maybe they don't have access to transportation, particularly if they're caught up in the war on drugs, they may have had their driver's license removed. Um, so all kinds of barriers to employment that a program, you know, could be designed to, to tackle one at a time. Well, being thoughtful seems to be uh, an overlapping theme in a lot of the work that you and your colleagues are doing. And it does take a, a thoughtful approach if we're going to try to do as much good as we can. That We've got the potential. We're at a, a decision point here, I believe, where we have the potential to really change the course of American energy as well as our economy and the culture and society that, that goes with it. And um, it sounds like you are hard at work in that struggle as well and uh, and helping to collaborate with others to, to push this conversation forwards. I'll just say there's a once in a lifetime opportunity right now to do all these things simultaneously, which is frankly, really the way it should be done. And so if you've never paid attention to, to politics or policy and the things I'm saying matter to you, now is the time to engage and pay attention at what's happening at the federal level. As we talked about, there's so many potential political obstacles. There's a, um, you know, there's real dedication and interest into making this happen, but so many obstacles uh, in Congress that can get in the way. So we've got to pay attention and, and help you know, break down those potential roadblocks. Yeah, change is progress take work and maintaining the status quo uh, 
is easy. In fact, all we have to do is not do the work and the status quo is most likely to just continue. And the status quo has been serving, you know, a subset of America for quite a while and they're quite happy with the way things are. Um, but I think that um, change, is, change is here, change is happening. And um, I'm glad to have had you as a guest to, to share some of these ideas with our listeners and uh, all the information will be in the show notes. Um, and now we've got to switch over to the Sword for All Better Together section. Uh, Amanda, do you have a, a book or author that you want to, to, to shine a light on for our, our listeners? I do. I think people should read Elizabeth Cat and What You Are Getting Wrong About Appalachia. There's so many, we sort of alluded to it earlier, but there's so many ideas about what cold country or what Appalachia is, but it's far, far more complicated than, than what people think it is. Um, so it's, that's a really good book to help straighten it out. Awesome. I'm going to put that on my list because I, I'm not familiar with that book. I sounds like I probably should be the way I'm talking. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think you'd like it. Great. And then uh, do you have a piece of advice or wisdom that you think would be useful uh, to folks interested in these conversations? Yeah, I mean, I think building a movement and, and making change, it doesn't happen overnight. It's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so you got to pace yourself. I think that's that's words I live by or try to. <laughs> yeah, well, you've made it this far. So that sounds like they, they're working. I do know some very enthusiastic folks that are, you know, learning about these issues and digging in. And I, I hope that they can benefit from that perspective. Um, otherwise, they might get really depressed really quickly. Yeah, no, I mean, they should know. I feel like I've been repeating myself for 15 years. <laughs> so I would say, wow, you know, I've heard, had folks say, wow, you were at the right place at the right time. Well, I've been waiting for the right place in the right time for a long time. <laughs> Let's uh, shift over to part two, the, the Better Together One Plus One playlist. This is available on Spotify and Apple and all the streaming services. And you can link to it as well in our uh, solar for all that show. Um, share two songs with us, uh, maybe something that's an old standard and an old favorite, and maybe something that you've bumped into recently that's on your earbuds. My oldie favorite is in keeping with what I just said, but it's Bittersweet Symphony by The Verve. How about something new? Um, I, I just fell in love with um, a song called Dance Monkey. I think it's Tones and I something like that um super super good song and i think it has an element of the experience of possibly racism um that somebody had well music is our modern poetry and uh speaks to you know what's on our minds and uh and how we're how we're dealing with this world we live in well thanks for that we'll be adding this to our playlists and uh thanks for all that you're doing, Amanda, and all you've done over the past decades, um, and for the work uh, that you're you're still knee deep up to your not knee deep, and you're up to your shoulders in. And thanks also to our sponsors, Third Sun Solar, and mostly to our listeners and uh, the folks out there um, that are spreading the word about this podcast, uh, bringing new guests to us, bringing the podcast to new listeners. The show notes and the resources available from uh, Amanda's uh, interview as well as other interviews are all available at solarforall.show. You know, keep up the fight, keep up the struggle, uh, keep your eye on the future we want um, because it takes work. And uh, if we slow down, the status quo will continue. And if we do the work, we're going to create the world we want. And uh, that seems to be a big message that you've got, Amanda. So thank you. 